There we are. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to Anchor Church. Glad that you are here with us online. Glad that you're here with us in the room. Got another little one going to join us in the room tonight. It's wonderful. So I hope you've had a good week. I hope things are going well for you. I know the Lord has been good to us at my house and has been good to our church this week. So welcome to uh, what the Lord is doing here. Um, as we do every week, If you're, uh, we're, we're going to continue in our, our study on the parables of Jesus. Tonight's going to be a bit of a review. We do have a new parable, but the, we're at a turning point in Jesus' ministry, so we're going to talk about that here shortly. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in giving to Anchor Church, there's a link down below this video where you can do that. It'll be It's tax-free. You can get a receipt for that because we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, none of that money goes to me. That all goes to the church. Um, so that is that is that if you're interested um, otherwise I don't have any other announcements this evening um, we do have some stuff coming up that uh, that are that's happening here on campus but we'll save that for another video for tonight Let, let's leave it that and let's look at what we've got to do because there's a lot we're gonna cover this evening in a short amount of time now we're gonna go to Lord in prayer and then we'll see what he has to say to us tonight Father, I thank you this evening for the chance to, to come together and to look at your word. I thank you for the, the, the writing of it, and I thank you, God, that we have a chance to look at the ministry of your son leading up to the greatest ministry that he did for us that we've just celebrated here with Easter a couple of weeks ago. I pray that you'll give me the words to speak tonight that will glorify you and will bring the word to your people in the way that they need to hear it. I pray that your spirit will be present with us so that those listening, however and wherever they're listening, will hear what they need to hear and give us wisdom in how we apply what we learn here tonight so we can bring you glory. In your name we pray. Amen. So tonight we're going to look at Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 14. I'm going to go ahead and read that parable uh, to start with this evening. And then we've got a lot of ground to cover before we actually start taking that apart. And actually looking at that parable is going to be the least of what we'll talk about this evening. But um, there will be a parable for this. We could, this one, uh, it's called the lowest soul, is what most people refer to this parable as being the lowest soul. And uh, we'll get to that toward the end. But let's read it for starters so we can get some, get some context on what's happening. Starting in verse 7 of Luke 14. He, that's Jesus, told a parable to those who were invited. That's important. When he noticed how they would choose the best places for themselves. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't recline at the best place because a more distinguished person than you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come and say to you, give your place to this man, and then in humiliation you will proceed to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and recline in the lowest place so that when the one who invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, When you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends and your brothers and your relatives or your rich neighbors, because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So this is not a parable that is taught as often. It's one of the less lesser known ones, although it's uh, it's one of my personal favorites and one that I'm, I'm interested to look at tonight. But as I said in the introduction tonight before we even prayed, this marks a turning point in the ministry of Jesus. If we look at the context of, of his ministry, we have reached a point now where from this point forward, Jesus is personally and continually under scrutiny and even being criticized for his ministry. We've seen the audience of the Pharisees and the, the religious people and the, the officials of the church and talked about them in several other parables where they were coming in the beginning they weren't even coming to see jesus they were coming because they wanted to keep an eye on john the baptist's disciples because they saw them as being a threat they were kind of you know the the rebel rousers they might be causing trouble and they were jesus or the disciples start over the pharisees the church folks they were interested in what might be happening among that group they began to take notice of Jesus because of the things that he was teaching. And in the beginning, they thought that the teaching of Jesus was wonderful. They had him speak in the temple a couple of times. They had him speak in the courtyard surrounding it. And they, I say they had him speak, not, not necessarily they invited him every time, but he was speaking in the context of, of what was considered a proper place for him to speak. And they felt that 
there may have even been a bit of ownership that they had over him because he was a good teacher and he was in their place. But then we watched that group begin to divide when Jesus began speaking outside of the temple. And we saw in the last several parables that we've read over the last few weeks how some of the Pharisees are beginning to get critical and be reserved because they feel their job and their livelihood is threatened if what Jesus is teaching is true. And there are others who are hoping that he's actually the fulfillment of the prophecy that it's actually their job to enforce and teach the people about. So we're going to watch that dynamic shift in this particular parable and the context of what's happening here. So the Pharisees that used to just be curious about him and used to just be watching him from a distance and were beginning to form opinions, now they've decided they need to interact with him personally. Not just, you know, one or two stragglers here and there, but they as a group have sought an audience with Jesus because they want to question him and they want to analyze his teaching. He's developed a reputation now, not just among the, the common people, but among everyone that knows his name, where he's making access to God a common thing. It was in the Old Testament and even in the time of Jesus's ministry, we're looking at a man or, or looking at a group of men who felt that as the Pharisees, they were the ones that were like the gatekeepers. They were the ones that were the people's access to God. And Jesus is now preaching that the common people would also have access to God and to the kingdom. He's preaching outside the synagogue. He's preaching a message that seems to favor poor people and marginalized people and uneducated people and common people. And he's, he's teaching in parables. So we've talked about, when we started this series, we talked about what parables are. He's, a, he's finding ways to make the scripture and the principles of God accessible and understandable to anybody that will listen. That's not been done before. The Pharisees have to take notice. And so they've invited him to dinner. And that's where we find him here. Let's talk for a little while about why they would have felt that was necessary. I'm, I've touched on it some here, but let's let, let's look at it a little more in depth. In the, and I keep using the word context. Let's look at it in the context or in the setting of what Jesus' ministry has been and even what we have learned about him up to this point. Jesus' teaching in parables made the scriptures accessible, but it also removed the authority and the influence of the priesthood, at least in the way they had grown fond of administrating it. We are the ones you have to come to us for preaching and teaching is what people felt like or what the, the Pharisees felt like, and even what the people had been taught. But now Jesus says, no, I'll, I'll come out to where you are, and I'll preach it to anybody that will listen. It threatened the traditions and the livelihood of the priesthood. They're thinking, if, if this system that we have built falls down and changes, how are we going to eat? How are we going to live? Who's going to support us? They're a bit selfish because they feel like, even the ones that aren't looking at their job as I'm privileged are looking at it as this is my livelihood. What's going to happen? The reason they have to be concerned about this is the audience that Jesus is attracting has grown wherever he goes. It's not just these 12 disciples. It's not the ragtag group of, of uh, you know, the, the crackpot followers of John the Baptist that are following him around now. He's drawing massive crowds of people wherever he goes to the point that when he wants to talk to his disciples, he has to pull them aside and make special time for them now. So anywhere he goes, people pay attention. So it's not just the disciples, it's not just the synagogue where he's teaching, it's not just a few meetings or a couple of weddings or a dinner here and there. Now it's large audiences. And we've reached a point also that it, the, and the thing that really becomes the point of concern, I think, for the Pharisees, if you try to read this in the way that it's written across all the Gospels, is now Jesus is, it bothered them that they, he would go outside of the church to teach. And it bothered him that they would go and try to share things that are, or that he would go and share holy things and precious things with the poor and the downtrodden. But what really got their attention was when influential people, when rich people, when important people began to pay attention to Jesus. We're now, now not just talking about the sick men that are laying in the streets and the beggars that are sitting outside the temple. You've got the story of the rich young ruler that we've already talked about where this man comes to Jesus and his name, I mean, we don't know his name, but we understand his function. He was rich. He was wealthy. He was young, which means he had a lot of years to accumulate more wealth and distribute the wealth that he had. And he was a ruler. He was some person of importance who was in charge. And he came to Jesus seeking counsel. Now, we don't have to reteach that story tonight. His motives are not the issue, but the fact that he sought Jesus out 
rather than going to the temple, he sought out this new teacher who's teaching outside of the temple and said, what do you have to say about my situation? That would make the men whose livelihood is the tithes and the offerings and the gifts and the privileges of being friends with that man, if it puts those things in jeopardy, suddenly they have a concern. we got to find out what this is about. We also have read the story already about Nicodemus, one of their own, who sought Jesus out. He snuck out in the night to ask him questions and have conversation with him about the message he was preaching and understand what does it mean to be born again. So the rich and influential are paying attention to Jesus, and now even some of their own are beginning to say, I need to understand what he has to say. So important people are now among the large crowds that are following him. Pharisees feel threatened. Apart from that, the things that he's teaching would have made the Pharisees uneasy, and it's not just one or two lessons at this point. This is the 17th parable that we've heard Jesus teach in the course of his ministry. If we go look at these other things, we start to see a thread that runs through everything Jesus has taught. I want to take a few minutes and review those tonight. If you go back to Matthew chapter 5, he taught Jesus talked about a lamp that was placed on a stand. And he stated very clearly that the purpose of his word is to reveal the truth. We don't take the light or take the, the basket and hide the lamp underneath it. We don't take our light and try to pretend it's something else. And we take it out into the public and it does things. It exposes what it sees. It draws the things that are interested in the light. It repels the things that are not. If the Pharisees are so concerned with their own influence, There are some things that they were engaged in that they may not have wanted people to see. And the idea that Jesus would go and preach that I'm going to bring the truth and it's going to reveal things would have made them nervous. He also clearly states in the word that he will, that the, or the word and the truth that he's teaching will expose the things that are hidden. It's not just going to tell people what the truth is. It's also going to take the things that are hidden in the corners that aren't the truth and show them to people. So there's two levels of things here. Here's what's true, and if what we're doing is all true, we have nothing to worry about. But if we say, I'm going to hide these things in the back room, and you're not going to know what's going on, but we're more than happy to show you this truth, now he goes a step further. He says, no, we're going to drag everything out into the light. We're going to expose what's hidden. So that includes the truth of the word itself. Yes, I'm going to present the truth to you, but it also means I'm going to show you the truth about the people that are leading you and of the lives that they're leading and I'm going to show you even the dark corners of yourself that need to change. That would have been disturbing to people that had something to hide. Then Jesus, in that same chapter of Matthew, he talks about salt. You know, so we got the the lamp on the stand, and then we have the message about salt and light mixed in there. Where we, when we studied that together, we said Jesus gives common people purpose. Salt, something that was so small and tiny, but makes such a big difference when it enhances everything that you add it to. And if it's properly preserved, it does great things to preserve other things along with it. Jesus says, you're common people, but you have great purpose. And he explained that those people, they had power and they had value. Salt was something that was used even for currency, like money. And those things, the people who have that kind of currency, they have influence. And he's comparing the kingdom of God to this. And he says, you have power, value, and influence in the kingdom of God, even if you were a seemingly common and small person. Then we look at the wise and foolish builders, the next the next parable that we looked at. We found that in Luke chapter 5, verse 46 is, is where we look at that passage. And he's talking about people that build in wise ways and people that build in foolish ways and the man who builds his house on the rock and the sand. And wisdom, as Jesus taught it in that passage, means people who will take action in the way that he does. The idea that people would act on their faith and that they would step out and do it in the same way that Jesus was, preaching highways and byways rather than preaching just in the temple, going out and encouraging people to have a relationship with the Lord for themselves, teaching this idea of of forgiveness of sin and healing and the power of God residing among the people. Oh, can you see how that would be disturbing to the Pharisees who thought we have a corner on this? And Jesus says, wisdom is for you to believe what I've taught you and then go put it into action in the same way that I am. He's encouraging people to act on a faith that they have some some say in. I don't need the priest to tell me. I can go to the Lord. Mm. That would turn some people's ideas on their head. Then we see the the parable about the money lender in Luke chapter 7. 
Jesus talks about this and he says there is forgiveness for all sin, great and small. And we're not talking about graduated sins where some require greater sacrifice and some require less. These people don't yet understand that Jesus will be the ultimate sacrifice, but he's setting the stage for that and saying there is forgiveness for all of the sin and sin just is sin as it is. He equalizes all of it and says there's not some grading or some level. God just hates sin, but there's a forgiveness for all of it. He also gives the the illustration in this parable of the money lender where he talks about small debt or small sin. No matter how little it is, it's impossible for us to repay what we owe. But it's equally easy for him to forgive the big and the small sins because there is so much grace and so much forgiveness in the heart of God. He tells us in this parable that being good people is not enough. He says grace and forgiveness are great equalizers that have nothing to do with the good of men. And this is where we see that that reference to the rich young ruler who says, good teacher, and Jesus says, whoa, 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 only God is good. People are not good. So the money lender, all sin is going to be forgiven. We're all on a level playing field according to the new, this new teaching of Jesus. Then we looked at the parable of the rich fool. And we pulled out this phrase that we actually ended up talking about. I talked with several of you online and even a couple of people in person. Um, what, you ma- what you own matters less than what owns you. If my possessions and my position, and my authority, and my title, and the things I do with my life, if those things are what controls me rather than me being controlled by the Almighty, what I have is not important. Who has me is what's important. And Jesus calls people in this parable to focus on what is eternal, not what is temporary, and to do that in a structure where the priests and Levites and the Pharisees had become very focused on the material reflection of what was going on in the heart rather than what was actually in the heart itself. This would have been concerning to them. And so we're beginning to see a theme here. And we're not even halfway through. We looked at the faithful and wise servants, the one who take care. Some of them were taking care of the house in such a way that no matter when the master came home, they would be prepared. And other ones were pretending the master might never get here. And when he comes home, he finds things undone that need to be done. And that's wickedness. We use that as an illustration, or Jesus used it as an illustration to talk about the importance of knowing the heart and the will of God and understanding what needs to be done in order for him to get honor and glory and to do those things selflessly, whether we see reward for them here on earth or not. Then we saw the parable in Matthew 13 about the weeds and the wheat. There's We learn from that parable the importance of allowing God to determine what is good and what is bad, not me trying to sort it out, not any human person. It's not up to man to look at this and say, this is good and this is bad. God determines those things and we simply do our best to reflect him and understand what he's decided. But it's God who decides. The implication here that there are weeds among God's people would have been a particular objection to the Pharisees, not because he was singling them out, but because they had some things to feel guilty about. And we find that in our own life. When a message gets preached on a Sunday, or when we hear someone even say an aside, or we read something out of a, uh, out of a devotional when we're spending time with the Lord, When we begin to feel convicted or uncomfortable with that truth, it often means that we are perhaps one of the problems being addressed. That message stepped on my toes because I'm aware of some things I need to fix. That devotion really has just had me grumpy and angry all day because it shined the light on me. There are some weeds among God's people, and even in God's people, there are some weeds in my own heart that need to be addressed and pulled out. The Lord used that parable to explain that we need some cleanup in our life and God's willing to do it, but he also exposed the fact that there were some people among those who said, I'm a Christian. I know we didn't use that word yet. I'm making it modern at the same time. There are people among those who say, I'm a Christian, or even people here who would have said, I am a faithful follower of God, who were actually playing God themselves and putting themselves in a very dangerous position. You don't get to decide what's right and wrong and what you will do and what you won't and what's good and bad. The Lord sorts that out and the Lord alone. Then we looked at a group of three parables together. A seed that was growing in the ground, a mustard seed and yeast. We said this is a kingdom of heaven trilogy. These are three things that Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like. 
And he used those three parables to talk about the power of the kingdom of heaven, what kind of influence and authority that it has. And he made it, he told the stories in a way that it made it available to anybody that would seek after God. If you're looking for him, the power and the influence and the authority of heaven dwell with you, the people of God. The kingdom of God is not being controlled by men, but we can participate in it and take part in it ourselves if we'll submit and follow him. The kingdom of heaven is like this. We talked about the kingdom being adaptive. It adapts to different environments to become effective, and it even changes inside of us so that we are most effective in the place where he puts us. We talked about how as a seed, the kingdom multiplies and it changes everything that it touches. We talked about how it's self-sufficient. We talked about how it's just everything that we need to grow that plant is even in the mustard seed that is so tiny and it's indestructible. There's no room for anything extra in it and that's what makes it so strong and makes it so effective and it's unable to be defeated. Once it hatches and begins to grow, it's one of the strongest, most dependable things that there is. And Jesus closes that series of messages about what the kingdom of heaven is like and he says, everyone who is under the authority of God and that's everybody. We're all, whether we accept and believe or whether we don't, we're all under the authority of God. Eventually, we will all submit to his authority. And the question we have to answer is, will we submit to it willingly so that we have direct access to God and participate in what he's doing? Or do we respond by rejecting it and suffer the consequences of being outside of it? We're all subject to his authority and his will. Then we looked at two other treasure or two other parables about treasure. One was a hidden treasure and one is a fine pearl. We find those in Matthew chapter 13. And we learn from those parables that the kingdom of God is priceless and we also learn that the kingdom of God is attainable for all people and it's worth doing whatever is necessary to take part in it. You remember the hidden treasure was the 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 coins that were found in a field, the treasure found in a field, and even though the man that found it was in his rights to take it, he did everything possible to make sure it was above board to acquire it. The fine pearl was the 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 jeweler or the the trinket holder in the marketplace that had come across something and he sold everything he owned because that one pearl was worth it. The kingdom is priceless and worth any cost to participate in and worth it to do whatever is necessary so that we personally have access to God and are able to do all that he wants us to do. It's worth any cost. We looked at the parable of the master and servant in Luke chapter 17 that tells us that the master and the servant are not equal. The master has an authority that we don't have and he absolutely has the right to tell us how we should behave and what we should and shouldn't do because of who he is. He's the only one that should deserve any praise or thanks or honor. We shouldn't be doing what we're doing to try to get accolades and perks and tell people, oh, what a good message you preached. Oh, what a good Christian you are. Oh, what a great mom you've been. We don't do it for that reason. The Lord gets all the glory and we simply do the work. Everybody in the kingdom is a servant that has duties and responsibilities and we're all serving the one master that has all the authority. Pharisees would have struggled with this from their position and then we read the story of the Good Samaritan. It was the last thing that we studied together in Luke chapter 10. We talked about the importance of understanding the word and knowing the heart of the master, not just being able to recite scripture and say that we know all the laws and all the rules. We have to understand him and understand what the word means so we can actually apply it and then model him for other people in the way that we model or the way that we live. We talked about the interpretation of the word. It's important that we understand it so we can interpret it properly because the way I read it and see it and hear it will determine how I behave. I've got to make sure I do that well. And it's better for me to properly hear and understand a small amount of it than to just be able to recite and memorize large sections of it because I can apply what I understand in a way that brings God glory. We can all attain some level of understanding that gives us the opportunity to represent Christ. You take all of these parables that we've read up to this point and we, we look at the things Jesus is teaching and who he's teaching them to and we realize the Pharisees are probably a little upset. They probably took this a little personally and felt some kind of way about it because much of it spoke to their misapplication of God and his heart and his intention for his people. So he's got this reputation. Jesus is 
He's preaching outside the parameters of what the Pharisees think he should. And he's teaching things that to them seem like they're against them and their style of administration. So they, they take issue with this. And when we arrive at this parable, we see that they have invited Jesus to a meal. And they've invited him to eat with them on the Sabbath. They've invited a man to come to the most important place with the most important people on the most important day. They're flexing a little bit. They're posturing a little bit. They want to make sure Jesus knows who they are and what position they hold, even in the invitation that they've given him to come to dinner so we can talk to you. So in that setting, very important men, very important day, they invite Jesus, and it's in that setting that Jesus shares this parable about taking the lowest seat. With that context, let's read this one more time and then look at what we learn from this. Starting again in verse 7. Jesus told a parable to those who were invited, and when he, when he noticed how they chose the best places for themselves. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't recline at the best place because a more distinguished person than you than you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come to you and say, give your place to this man. And then in humiliation, you will proceed to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the lowest place so that when the one who invited you comes, he will say, friend, move up higher. You will then be honored in the presence of all the other guests for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That had to sting a little. We're very important people and we've invited you here to have a very important conversation with you on this very important day. And Jesus says, you shouldn't be worried about looking important. That's the last thing that you should be concerned with. And Jesus keeps going. He also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a lunch or a dinner, like the one we're sitting at right now, don't just invite your friends and your brothers and your relatives and your rich neighbors, like the men you've invited to sit here with me today, because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. Remember how he was concerning them because important people were paying Jesus some attention and perhaps that would take away from what they had coming their direction. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, who are maimed, who are lame, who are blind. The ones that you normally would say they're not holy and worthy enough to even come in and worship with us. Oh, it speaks to my heart. Invite those people and you'll be blessed because they can't repay you. For all will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Seeing now who Jesus is talking to and the circumstances he's been invited under, we consider this message and we see fairly plainly what the message is. The message of this parable to these very important men is one of humility. There's two really unique things about that parable. First of all, you'll notice when we read it that Jesus speaks to the Pharisees in the exact same way that he spoke to the common, unlearned, blue-collar people in Jerusalem and Israel. The Pharisees were used to having these long speeches where they quote and use big, high, you know, very high, lofty language to read the words of the prophets among themselves and discuss things at this high academic level. And one of the things they complained about was that Jesus was preaching these, these great, godly, holy concepts to lowly people in a very common, lowly way. And when Jesus shows up to their very important dinner, he talks to them the same way that he talks to the lowly, unimportant people. He told them a parable to make it simple so that it, they could understand it. Another unique thing about this parable is that rather than leaving the interpretation to the listener, as Jesus so often did. We see, him, we, we see him go and tell parables and he shares them with people and he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And then he walks away and he's done. He doesn't explain it. He doesn't lay anything out. But here, rather than leaving the interpretation to the listener, he tells them exactly what he meant. He had never done this with an audience before, ever in his ministry. He occasionally would pull the disciples aside and explain to them what had happened. 
That's his inner circle. That's those closest to him. Those are the ones he's going to empower and send out to do the work in his stead once he goes home to the Father. But that's just that handful of people. He had never given the audience at large the explanation before. So he talks, essentially, he's not talking down to the Pharisees in the sense of degrading them, but he's letting them know, I'm going to treat you the same way I treat everyone else because this is an equalizing message. And just to make sure you get the point, I'm not going to leave any question what I said. I'm going to tell you exactly what I mean. The Pharisees would have understood what he was doing. And they would have taken the point rather sharply, perhaps even harshly, probably even would have been offended a little. You've talked to me like a commoner, and then you felt the need to explain it to me. You've heard the term mansplaining before. It's popular in our culture. Jesus was not doing this to degrade them, but they would have because they were offended, because their hearts were pricked, because they realized what he was saying to them they would have taken it very much that way. You're explaining something to me that I should be smart enough to understand. That's the tone that the the Pharisees are taking in receiving this message. Seems silly to ask this question, but for the sake of the study, let's look at it. Why would that parable, being told in that way, be so significant to that audience? Humility is something that the Pharisees obviously lacked. And humility is something that it's the most mentioned characteristic of all, or the most mentioned characteristic of every believer in Scripture. When we look at the people that God speaks of and he mentions their name and he holds them in high esteem and their names actually make it, whether it's the Old or the New Testament, when someone's name gets mentioned and they're claimed to be a great believer, humility is the thing that gets the most mentions of anything when we're talking about their characteristics. And that's the subject of this parable. He taught this to the most esteemed and prideful men in all of Israel, the priests and the Pharisees. And he chose humility to talk to them about. And when we talk about that being a big subject, like, well, but there should, surely there are some other things that got talked about a whole lot more. Love is the thing that most people say first when you ask, you know, what, what was the message of Jesus? It was love. <laughs> In, in the context, or in the, in the, the entirety of Jesus' min- ministry, love is only mentioned 47 times. Seems like a lot, but 47 mentions. Faith <laughs> would seem like something. We mention that a lot. Faith is only in, mentioned in Jesus' ministry 94 times in his teaching. <coughs> We've talked about knowledge before, and he talks a lot about knowledge, but it only gets 103 mentions. But humility is mentioned 179 times. 179 times. <coughs> we think love is the big one, and we say 40, and there's only 47 of that, but humility gets 179. Having a humble heart is the cornerstone and the foundation of our faith in Christ. And it was important that Jesus share that with these men because they lacked it, so they had no foundation upon which to build this new covenant that he said he was leaving with them. If you look at verses 10 and 11 of this passage uh, that we just read, I'll read what the scripture says. It says, but when you are invited, go and recline in the lowest place so that when the one who invited you comes, he'll say, friend, move up higher. It's the ministry of Jesus right there. Friend, come up higher. Son, daughter, one that I love, don't think so lowly of yourself. Let me invite you up. If you think highly of yourself, we have a problem. He says, you'll be honored in the presence of the guests if you sit lowly. But if you exalt yourself, verse 11, you will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That's the ministry of Jesus. Let me call you up higher. Let me bring you up and esteem you. Choose a low place for yourself. And if you need to be elevated, let me do that. If we read that, or if we look at that, say, say in our own words, or if I were to kind of dumb that down, it's better to humble yourself and get lifted up than it is to exalt yourself and be humiliated. That humility and, and humble, they come from the same same word. You know, being humble is a state of mind. It's the idea that I would willfully prefer others above me. Humiliation, which comes from the same root word, means I have been humbled or put down against my will. Humility, I'm willing to be low. Humiliation, I am forced down against my will. The point is, 
God is the only one that gets exalted and God commands us to be humble. In his presence, we're all brought low. And among his people, we should think ourselves more lowly than the next person. We should prefer them above ourselves. That's the kind of love that he did preach about the 47 times that he mentions it in Scripture. God says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And God will get humility out of us one way or the other. And he's not going to do it in a way that is, that is unjust or is about humiliating us for the sake of proving a point. It's simply the default reaction. If you've sat in the wrong place at the table, you're going to be asked to move. And whether that means you'll be moved up or moved down has to do with your opinion of yourself versus the position that the Savior has given you or set aside for you. The principle of that is in this parable here. Better to be humble and let the Lord exalt you than to exalt yourself and find out I'm not who I said or what I thought I was. And then Jesus takes that even further in the next principle he shares. It's interesting because this is one that it, it all of these principles, honestly, they apply whether we're dealing with faith or not, but they're most important in our faith. If you look at verses 12 through 14, I'm just going to paraphrase those and say, it's better to be generous to humble and lowly people than it is to surround myself with important people and become arrogant and think more highly of myself than I should. I mean, Jesus, in a very kind way, calls them arrogant when he looks at this room full of self-important people and says, it's better for you to serve the humble than to hold a big feast like this and invite all these important people and posture in front of me in the way that you've done today. It is better to help those that are in need than it is to only help the people that benefit you. Humility is a really unique trait in the kingdom of God. It's unique because you don't have a whole lot of people that seek that out. But it's the one thing, it's the one gift, it's the one trait, it's the one characteristic of God that absolutely anyone can have. Anyone can be humble. I can choose to be humble. I can choose humility. I can choose to, to elevate other people and hold them in higher esteem than myself. That's a choice that I make. That's an attitude or a trait or a characteristic that I can cultivate within myself that God will honor. There are very few of those. Anyone can have it. And anyone who does it, humility, it does something different than anything else does because it immediately elevates the people around you. There's not another thing that you can do that makes everyone else around you better. There's not another thing. You can love them, you can care for them, but people can look at your kindness and think you're looking down on them. People can look at your love and say, that just seems like charity. Or they can, they can discount it and say, that's what you're supposed to do. You have to love me. But the minute that I esteem someone better than me, take the better seat than me. No, here, you have the last bite. You have my last $5. You are more important than I am. The minute that you lift someone up and say, I'm going to treat you, in the way that God would treat you by lifting you up from your station. We have the opportunity with that to mirror Jesus and actually make everyone around us better. And now it may cost us something because there are some people that will look at that bad look at that badly. You'll have some arrogant people that when you treat them like they're better than you, they'll pretend they deserve that. And that may not be true, but that takes nothing away from me serving the Lord with my humility. I've still exalted the person around me. There are other people who will have a hard time accepting it because they see themselves as lower than you. And I'm not talking about that, that fake church thing that we do. It's like, oh, no, brother, it's just the Lord. You go first, the last is first, and the first is last. Oh, no, 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 brother, I couldn't dare. You're so much. That's garbage. We're talking about genuine humility that mirrors Jesus because his message and his ministry and his posture for 33 years on earth was taking people who are, I mean, he's fully man and fully God, and he literally made those other people more important than him. I will die the worst death that I can die. I will cook food for you while we sit on the beach. I will preach and teach to you that, that don't deserve to hear the word. I, Jesus did everything he did to try and lift and elevate the people around him when he was obviously the one that deserves the most attention and the most glory and the most honor of anybody. Even to the point that he, he said to the, the rich young ruler, don't even call me good. Huh. Humility mirrors Jesus. Anyone can have it. And it's the only thing we can do that instantly elevates and improves everyone around us.
It's the closest thing we can do to Jesus' ministry. Not all of us have got money. Not all of us have got time. We're very busy people. Not all of us have got the gift to preach or to teach or to speak publicly or to, to, to hold the attention of an audience. Not all of us are entertaining. Not everybody has great management skills. Not everyone has the same kind of anointing or gift or talent or skill set. But everyone can make the choice to prefer somebody else. Jesus speaks to these men as if they were commoners because he's speaking to them according to their station in the kingdom rather than the way they see themselves. And in doing so, he's hoping that they will humble themselves so that he can elevate them to a position that's even higher and even more valuable than the one that he sees himself or that they see for themselves. Jesus is trying to redirect their attention to something that's eternal and valuable rather than just the perks that they have acquired from doing godly work. It's not difficult to see how that applies today. I'm, I'm already just blurring the lines between why is it important to them and why does it matter to us because it's hard to separate because it's so obvious. We shouldn't make ourselves out to be important and we shouldn't make too much of our good deeds. True humility lifts other people up. There's a lot of, uh, I see these videos online because I spend a lot of time on, on online ministering to some of you on the other side of this screen even. And we see those videos of people that walk out with a, with a camera and a stack of money and they want you to see that they have given a bum a thousand dollars. They want you to see that they have paid off the college debt for some poor student. They, they make a big display of it kind of in the same way the Pharisees would stand on the corner and say, look at what a good speaker I am. Or kind of in the way the Pharisees would invite Jesus to lunch and say, we're, ha we're having a very important dinner and we, we, hope you'll, we hope you'll attend. We shouldn't make ourselves out to be important and we don't make too much of the good deeds that we do. My humility should exalt other people and, and lower me. If I'm getting all the credit for doing a great thing, that's not humble at all. When we truly exalt other people, it shows the proper respect to the people that deserve it and it elevates and encourages the people that most need it. And it allows God the opportunity to exalt us in the ways that matter. And those are not always going to be here on earth. If I'm humble here, I may remain humble here for all of my days. Humble in my attitude that I exalt others and also humble in the fact that there may be nobody who notices the work that I do until the day comes that I reach heaven. It's the message of this parable. In order to be valuable in the kingdom of God and to do his work, we don't have to be great leaders. We don't have to have titles. We don't have to be seen or recognized by anybody. But it's absolutely vital that the Lord knows who we are and he sees those that elevate other people. He sees those that are humble and contrite in their spirit. We fulfill our function of giving God glory when we refuse to take any for ourselves. Sincerely refuse to take any for ourselves. When we show respect and we show kindness and we bring justice and we show love to his creation... That's what he did, and he did it by saying, no, let me lift you up. Let me exalt you. I'm not interested in the perks of being important. I have plenty of that in the life to come. While I'm here, let me lift you up. Let me maybe give you a little bit better view of the heaven that I see in my future. And perhaps it will inspire you to serve my king and my savior. This is what Jesus did. It's the example he gives, and this is the message he gives to this group of people. It's the example of his life. He said, the way we accomplish our purpose is to humble ourselves before people and present ourselves before him. It's a difficult message for a group of people that thought highly of themselves. And we'll see from this point forward as we continue to study these parables. It's at this moment in this position that we see the Pharisees suddenly are not so much on Jesus' side. That division between them is not now one that is curious and hopeful versus one that is skeptical and unsure. We're going to watch them unite and say, we can't let this happen. Because there will always be people that say, I like being important, I'm not willing to yield. You will have unsaved people who say, I'm not willing to yield and bend my knee to the Almighty God. You will have people who hold on to their positions of power and authority. They're not willing to come down to the level. Oh, how it's hard to say this and see it, but some will not bring themselves to the lowness of life that Jesus Christ was willing to bring himself to. And until we are, we have no part in what comes after this life. Humility.
It's the cornerstone of our faith. It's the point of this parable. And it's the concept I leave you with tonight. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your perspective as hard as it is on what it means to be humble. As hard as it is to pray, Lord, I pray that your spirit would work in us to take away any desire that we have for recognition, for exaltation, to, to receive any perks for what we do for you. God, teach us to live in a way that doesn't take anything away from your glory, but brings all attention to you. Teach us to live in a way that lifts up those who are around us in the way that your son did. Give us a perspective on who we are, not so that we'll think poorly of ourselves, but so that we will think rightly of ourselves in light of who you are. Thank you for caring enough about us to give us the example of your son so we can understand how we can live in such a way that glorifies and honors you. We love you, Lord. It's good to be with you tonight. Keep us safe as we go. Bring us back at the next appointed time that you give us to be in your presence together and in every moment in between. May we bring glory to your name. We pray this in the name of your son. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. I look forward to seeing you again very soon.